Hi guys, that's me, Filip Tverdi again. In my fourth lecture on the history of philosophy of language, I'm going to talk about Ludwig Wittgenstein. He's quite important philosopher of the 20th century, uh, and that's the reason why I have two lectures on him, this one and the next one in the next week. Ludwig Wittgenstein is one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century. His influence on philosophy and linguistics and many other social sciences is really, really huge. He was not only a philosopher, but also a logician and mathematician, and also, and I'm going to talk about it a bit, an aviation engineer and architect. He was born in 1889 Vienna. His uh, family was very rich. They owned a steel industry in Austrian Hungarian Empire. I'm not sure if you know what you can see in the presentation, but this is a logo of Czech factory called Poldi Kladno, and it is a picture of Wittgenstein's mother. She was called Leopoldin. Home version of her name is Poldi. So that's her. Lady Wittgenstein in the logo of the largest Czech steel factory. As I said, Wittgenstein was born in 1889, and I think that this is a year that could interest you, because other famous thinkers of the 20th century were born in 1889. Adolf Hitler and Martin Heidegger. I'm not sure if you've heard about Martin Heidegger. You are going to hear about him again today. He is a quite famous German philosopher, one of those heavyweight thinkers, and a proponent of a philosophical movement called phenomenology. And the other guy is, of course, Adolf Hitler, who was not only a thinker, but also a doer. And there is a quite interesting connection between Wittgenstein and Hitler. They both went to the same grammar school. It was in Linz. And as you can see in this picture, they really shared the same schoolyard. Ludwig Wittgenstein is that seriously looking guy in the circle on the left. And Adolf Hitler is that mean, a bit brutal boy on the right. Mm, there is an interesting book on the topic by British historian Kimberly Cornish. You can see that on the cover of that book is the same picture. You probably would imagine that Hitler bullied Wittgenstein in grammar school. By the way, probably it was otherwise. Uh, that this is a quite speculative hypothesis by Cornish, but it is said that uh, Hitler's anti-Semitism was based on his hate of Wittgenstein and his family. Wittgenstein was quite mm, harsh on Hitler. It is sad. I'm not sure about that. So don't take my word too seriously. Wittgenstein was a very talented student, mainly in comparison with Adolf Hitler. Wittgenstein studied technical university in Berlin, and then he moved to Manchester, where he studied aeronautics, and he was quite successful in that. This is a picture of his invention. It's some kind of propeller that has engine jets in the end of both sides. Uh, he patented this invention and it is still used in some um, quite uncommon means of transport. But during his studies in Berlin and Manchester, Wittgenstein got interested in mathematics and philosophy. And he went to Jena, where he studied for a while under Gottlob Frege, but then he moved to Great Britain, to Cambridge, and he studied there under Bertrand Russell. So we might say that Wittgenstein had two really excellent teachers, uh, the most famous German logician and the most famous British philosopher of that time. But unfortunately for Wittgenstein, he went to World War I, where he really fought. There's an interesting connection to Olomouc because Wittgenstein spent a few weeks or maybe a few months in Olomouc in 1916, where he was trained uh, to become a lieutenant. This is a picture of our main square with City Hall 
uh, from the year 1916. The interesting factoid is that when Wittgenstein came to Olomouc, he was very keen about our city hall and he wanted to live in its tower, but he wasn't able to, so he had to live with his friends. But then after Olomouc, uh, Wittgenstein was sent to Russia in Italy. And again, unfortunately for him, he was imprisoned. And as a prisoner of war, he spent a few months in Italian um, front. Well, he started writing his first and probably most famous book there. It is called Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. He started writing it in 1917 and finished it in 1920. And it was published in German in 1921 and in English in 1922. So this escalated quite quickly. After Wittgenstein published his Tractatus, he stopped doing philosophy. He had this feeling that he solved all those troubles, all those problems philosophers had since ancient Greece. So he changed career. He moved to Austria again, uh, to a small village in Lower Austria, and he taught at a village elementary school. Unfortunately for Wittgenstein again, he had to resign after a few years because he used corporal punishment and quite harsh. It wasn't uncommon to use corporal punishment on boys, but Wittgenstein used severe beatings on girls too, and this was frowned upon among other teachers and mainly among parents. So Wittgenstein had to stop teaching and he had to leave that small uh, bucolic village. I imagine this situation in the same way as are those scenes from B-movies like Frankenstein when angry villagers haunt the monster out of the village, and in this case, the monster was Wittgenstein. He didn't know what to do with his life. Again, uh, I want to mention that he was from a very, very rich family. So he worked for a while as a gardener, uh, and then he uh, did some architecture planning. He built a villa for his sister. But after some time, he moved to Cambridge University again, and he stayed there, writing and teaching until his death. In the 30s, he started to invent a new system of his philosophy. He radically changed his ideas, and he started to work on his second famous book, and his second book uh, that is called Philosophical Investigations, this book uh, hadn't been finished and it was published posthumously in 1953. We can say that during his lifetime, Wittgenstein had two very different philosophical approaches. And this is the reason why his two stances are usually called Wittgenstein I and Wittgenstein II, as these were two quite different persons. In the first phase of his philosoph philosophy, he was a proponent of ideal language philosophy. This is a philosophy that is uh, presented in Tractatus Logica Philosophicus. In his second phase, he was more keen of ordinary language philosophy. Uh, this is the philosophy that was published in uh, Philosophical Investigations. So we might say that Wittgenstein really turned his philosophy upside down, that he went head over heels. Mm. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Tractatus Logica Philosophicus is quite a peculiar book, I would say. The main reason is that it's not a common prose, it's not written in common prose. It's a set of hierarchically numbered statements that are, according to Wittgenstein, self-evident. There is no need to uh, give an argument about them. If you have a look in Mm, tractators, you could see that there are seven main propositions about logic, language, and world, and there are also many other sentences and propositions that are, as I said, hierarchically numbered. Uh, this is a quite random page from the beginning of Tractatus. You can see that there is the first sentence, one, the world is all that is the case, then there is sentence, 
1.1, and then there is 1.11 and 1.12, and so on and so on. As I said, and I say it again, these sentences are hierarchically numbered. According to Wittgenstein, uh, the Tractatus is a definite answer to all those questions philosophers had. In the preface, he wrote, and I quote, The truth of the thoughts that are here communicated seems to me unassailable and definitive. I therefore believe myself to have found on all essential points the final solution of the problems. You can see that Wittgenstein was a very self-confident thinker and it is quite paradoxical that in 1928 and 1930s he changed his mind completely and started to work on a completely different philosophical system. The main theory of Tractatus is usually called picture theory of language. I would say that the main idea behind that is quite simple, but Wittgenstein was probably the first one who um, formulated this theory in this quite clear and simple manner. According to Wittgenstein, the reality has three levels, and you can see it on this diagram on the right side. Those three levels is the world, the mind, and the language. And according to Wittgenstein's account, mind is a picture of the world, and language is a picture of the mind, which means, by the way, that in some way, language is a picture of the world too. It somehow mirrors what exists in reality. The world is based on facts, mind is based on thoughts, and language's main atom is a sentence or a preposition, which can mean that thoughts are pictures of facts and prepositions are pictures of thoughts. This is the reason why this all is called picture theory of language, because in the end, again, prepositions are pictures of facts. Prepositions mirror somehow what really exists in the world. I gave you a few quotes from Tractatus, and I'm going to read them as an illustration uh, to my um, to my uh, explanation. The first one is: the world is the to a totality of facts, not of things. A logical picture of facts is a thought, and the totality of true thoughts is a picture of the world. You can see that I was right, uh, and in the end, you can also say that. A preposition is a picture of reality, and the totality of prepositions is language. This is a short summary of picture theory of language. I'm going to get back to picture theory of language later on in my lectures, because I will show you other thinkers who criticized uh, Wittgenstein's account of language. But now I want to tell you a few things about the status of philosophy, because I find it very interesting. According to Wittgenstein, philosophy is not one of the natural sciences. It doesn't mean that Wittgenstein was anti-science, or that he was anti-scientific, or something like that. He just thought that the aim of philosophy is something completely different that of natural sciences. Let me show another quote from Wittgenstein Tractatus. Philosophy aims at the logical clarification of thoughts. Philosophy is not a body of doctrine, but an activity. Philosophical work consists essentially of elucidations. Philosophy does not result in philosophical propositions, but rather in the clarification of propositions. Without philosophy, thoughts are, as it were, cloudy and indistinct. Its task is to make them clear and to give them sharp boundaries. Unquote. Which means that, according to Wittgenstein, philosophers are mm, something like policemen. They just make, make sure that other people and other thinkers communicate in a clear way. 
And if they see, according to Wittgenstein, that someone uh, doesn't make sense, that he or she uses unclear sentences, unclear prepositions, philosophers should say something about that. And they should try to make our ideas more clear and to give them sharp boundaries. I can use a more technical term for what Wittgenstein wanted to do with philosophy, and it's demarcation. To demarcate something means to find a line, a border between something and something else. And according to Wittgenstein, we have to find a border between mm, meaning and nonsense, between sentences that have meaning and between sentences that don't. Philosophy, according to Wittgenstein, sets limits to the much disputed sphere of natural science. According to Wittgenstein, the picture of the world is presented by natural sciences, which means that all those true sentences we have are part of natural science. Philosophy must set limits to what can be thought, and in doing so, to what cannot be thought. It must set limits to what cannot be thought by working outwards through what can be thought. I'm sorry that Wittgenstein's writing is sometimes a bit obscure. He wasn't able to um, present his ideas in a clear way, unfortunately for him. But uh, what was going on, I can show you in this diagram. There, are, there is a large set of meaningful sentences, and this is the language. And the language describes the world, and the set of all true sentences is the science or the natural science. And except that, there is another realm, and it is the realm of nonsense. According to Wittgenstein, this set of, I don't know how to explain it, feelings or intuition or intuitions is presented by mysticism or so-called metaphysics, which is one of the oldest philosophical mm, subsciences or disciplines that is about that mystic feeling we probably all have. According to Wittgenstein, we cannot use language in this other realm. We cannot use language when we talk about mystic experiences because we would produce nonsensical sentences. So it's a better way not to talk about it at all. And according to Wittgenstein, to this nonsensical area of human knowledge belongs not only metaphysics and mysticism, but also ethics and aesthetics, those normative sciences that are about rules, what is good and what is beautiful. Wittgenstein wrote a lot about the difference between sense and nonsense, about the difference between meaningful sentences and nonsensical ones. Wittgenstein thought that finding the difference, the line between sense and nonsense, is the main and maybe the only task of philosophy. So I will give you some more quotes to illustrate his approach. This is probably my favorite quote from Tractatus. Everything that can be put, that can be thought at all can be thought clearly. Everything that can be put into words can be put clearly. This is what I really like because this is exactly what I think. If you want to say anything, you should use simple words. You don't have to use some neologisms or special jargon. You don't have to use difficult DPTs to illustrate your ideas. You should make your ideas clear, as I repeat again and again. Another quote. When the answer can be put into words, neither can the question be put into words. The riddle does not exist. If a question can be framed at all, it is also possible to answer it. And that's my other 
favorite quote because I interpret it in a way that there are no deep problems because there are no deep answers to them. If you want to think about the meaning of life and about the existence of some transcendent beings that are omniscient and, uh, I don't know, creators of everything, well, go on, but don't talk about it. Because if you cannot express your ideas in simple words, it means probably that you don't have a solution to the riddle. That means that the riddle probably does not exist. Which means that in the end, um, Wittgenstein recommends to be silent about some heavy stuff. This is the last sentence of Tractatus. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. And again, I'm quite keen about that sentence. I quite enjoy it. Uh, it's probably better to pass some heavy stuff in silence than to speculate about them without borders. I'm going to talk about Wittgenstein again in my next lecture, but I want to mention uh, one other important thinker of this idea who is also my quite favorite one, and is Rudolf Carnap. Carnap was a member of the Vienna Circle, which was a group of early 20th century philosophers. It was a part of logical empiricism or logical positivism or a neo-positivism. These thinkers were very scientific. They wanted to make philosophy in the image of science. Founder of the Vienna Circle was Austrian philosopher Moritz Schlick, who was murdered by his insane student before World War II began. But other members were very important, heavy philosophers from that era, like Otto Neurath and Karl Popper. And other members were, for example, logician Kurt Gödel or physicist Albert Einstein and many, many others. The Vienna Circle was heavily influenced by ideas and writings of Wittgenstein. During its early years, only Tractatus was read sentence by sentence, and there were very long discussions about every aspect of the text. The main topic of the Vienna Circle philosophers was meaningfulness, which means the existence of sentences without meaning, and also creating of the illusion of profundity. The Vienna Circle philosophers were interested in those thinkers who pretend that they have deep thoughts, even in cases when they really are intellectually impotent and they don't have anything important to say, which is quite common, I'm afraid, in academia, not only in the 20s and 30s, but also in the 21st century. The main idea of Carnap's philosophy of language was so-called verification principle. It's derived from the term verification, which means um, comparing with reality, something like that. To verify something means to find out if the sentence is true or not. According to Carnap, words are meaningful only if their empirical criteria are known, which means that I can say that a word is meaningful only in the case when I know what it refers to, what it denotes. So, for example, a term a rabbit is meaningful because I understand that it denotes all rabbits that exist in the world. But according to Carnap, there are some pathological areas of language, for example, pseudo-concepts and pseudo-statements. Pseudo-concepts are words that seem as words, but they do not have meaning, which means that they are not concepts at all. And uh, Carnap gave us a lot of terms from, or a lot of examples from the history of philosophy. So according to Carnap, pseudo-concepts are, for example, the idea, the absolute, the unconditioned, the infinite, the being of being, 
non-being, thing in itself, absolute spirit, objective spirit, essence, being in itself, being in it for itself, emanation, manifestation, articulation, the ego, the non-ego, and so on and so on. According to Carnap, some of these terms had meaning sometime in history. For example, the term, the idea, just means something you have in your head. But when you write it with a capital I in the beginning, it loses its meaning. No one knows what it really means because it doesn't have any empirical criteria. It doesn't have any empirical meaning, which means that the term itself is meaningless. Maybe more dangerous, according to Carnap, are pseudo sentences. And these are sentences that, uh, that include pseudo concept or uh, that have defective logical syntax, pseudo statements, pseudo sentences. Again, Carnap gave us a few examples. Uh, his artificial example is, for example, this statement. Caesar is a prime number. We can see that this sentence, this statement, consists of real words because all the parts have meaning. Caesar denoted a man that lived in Roman times and a prime number is something we understand that uh, has its meaning in a mathematical language. But when we put together Caesar and a predicate, a prime number, it doesn't make any sense. It's a pseudo statement because its logical syntax is incorrect. Other <laughs> nice example comes from Noam Chomsky, who wrote, Calores green ideas sleep furiously. Of course, it's a joke because all these terms are meaningful, but when we put them together in this statement, it doesn't make any sense. And my probably most favorite is a example created by logician Stephen Yablo. More people have been to Germany than I have. It takes some time to understand that this sentence doesn't mean anything. It creates an illusion of normality, but if you give it a thought, you can see that it can be used in a correct communication. But probably the most famous example of pseudo statement from the history of philosophy comes from Martin Heidegger, that German philosopher who was born in 1889, in the same year as Ludwig Wittgenstein. Martin Heidegger wrote a lot of nonsensical texts, but a famous example is the nothing itself nothings. According to Carnap, this sentence includes a pseudo concept, the nothing, written with capital N, but also it includes defective syntax because it nothings. It's not correct to use it in a real language. So according to Carnap, this is some kind of charlatanism that you produce when you want to when you want to seem that you are highly intelligent and wise. According to Carnap, Heidegger probably wasn't. I gave you a required reading from Carnap's essay called The Elimination of Metaphysics that was published in German in 1931. I gave you just four pages, but I think that it might be useful to read it whole. It's a very uh, well written and uh, I think that it's important for your future academic careers. I gave you five questions and please try to answer them based on your reading. The first one is, what is the difference between concepts and pseudo-concepts? How did pseudo-concepts originate? I gave you some hints in my lecture, but try to find more precise answers to, the, uh, to this. The second question is, what are pseudo-statements? How are they constructed? Again, I gave you some hints, but uh, you, ca you can do probably better. Then there is a practical example in question number three. Explain what TV and TUV means. These are terms that Carnap invented as an example for concepts and pseudo-concepts. There is also a controversial question, is God a real concept or a pseudo-concept? The answer might not be 
as simple as it seems, because according to Carnap, there are at least three contexts where we can use the concept of God. And the last question is just for your own thinking. It's a food for thought. Do you think that sometimes unintelligibility cannot be avoided? My answer to the last question is categorical no. I think that unintelligibility must be avoided at all times and at all costs. Because the basis of any communication is understanding. So we have to try to be understood in the same way as our audiences try to understand what we say or write. My favorite uh, comic strip is made by Zach Wienersmith. It's published every day on this web page and it's called Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial. Wienersmith usually comes with something very funny, but there is also a deeper meaning and we should lead, we should be led by his example, I think. This is a joke called Science Articles A Guide. And as you can see in this table, there are two types of subject matter. You can see it on the left. Uh, subject matter might be complex or subject matter might be simple. And there is also mm, there are also two kinds of academic writing. And the first one, average sentence is easy to understand. And the second one, average sentence is hard to understand. So imagine a situation when you write about complex matter and you use easy to understand sentences. It means that you are a great writer. Congratulations. There are not many like this. I know some of them, but they are quite uncommon still, unfortunately. Uh, more common is the second case when the subject matter is complex, but the sentences are hard to understand. This is according to Wiener Smith's typical writing. So it's a lot of us uh, use this kind of writing because we can do better. There are also two more cases when subject matter is simple. You can write in a simple matter. You, your sentences are easy to understand. It's honest writing. You don't have a lot to say usually because you write about banal things in banal words. But the last and most dangerous case is when the subject matter is simple and your every sentences are hard to understand. And according to Ines Miss, usually it means that it's probably just bullshit. And I think it's very common in academia to write about simple stuff in obscurant, hard to understand way. So we can discuss it next week in our online meeting. I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience. See you next time.